Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, God says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we know this is God's will. This is the series we're going through four weeks. We've covered being guided by the Holy Spirit and also empowered by the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to look at restoration that comes from the Holy Spirit. And you can turn to Psalm 32. That's where we'll start today. And I think it's fitting that this theme comes on the heels of the tragedy that just happened in France. And I think it's important we're all praying for that situation and praying across the world. So let's go ahead and pray together and then we'll get into God's word. Father, we thank you that you are the healer, that you are the one who lifts our heads and you are the one who restores. And Father, we lift up Paris to you now and the people there who are grieving and uh, confused and scared. And Lord, we pray that they would be turning to you and your comfort and your presence, God, would make such a difference in this time of mourning. And we pray, God, that you would restore. And we also, God, pray that we would be people who understand the times we're living in. And we, we would be people who don't give up but pray. And Lord, it just reminds us how much the world needs you, Jesus. And so, Father, we pray in our own wounds and brokenness today that you would restore by your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Restoration can happen on many levels in our lives, and there's so many ways that God can bring restoration. This was a significant week in our family's history because we had an adoption and finalized on Thursday, and it was such a scene in the courtroom. We had a, a wonderful judge. <laughs> And, and such a personal judge, and after everything was official, the judge came over, and we just had this big hug together with our new little one right in the middle. And so I was obviously moved, and um, it was just such a, a special time. And then my family came up last night, so now we're together after waiting three weeks. I don't know how some people do it who travel all the time and are away from their families. So I'm just so glad to be back together, and then next Friday, Lord willing, we'll get all our stuff up here too. So Thanksgiving will kind of feel like Christmas in our, in our family. But uh, when you think about our culture and the intrigue and the curiosity with restoration and all the television shows, HGTV and Fixer Uppers with houses and Biggest Loser and Gas Monkey Garage and fixing up cars. And some people like to watch restoration. Other people like to experience restoration. I have a lot of friends who restore cars. I have friends who like to restore houses. And the Holy Spirit invites us in to watch restoration and be inspired by what he's doing in other people's lives, but then also to experience restoration, not just to watch restoration. So today we're going to look at you know, how does restoration work? Not just cars and houses, but what about our souls? How does the Holy Spirit work? in our lives to bring restoration. So we're gonna look at three aspects today. And the first one might be surprising, but it's actually accountability. And so in Psalm 32, and drop down to verse five, this is written by David, and we're gonna enter into his story. But Psalm 32, verse five. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. There's a lot in that verse, but I don't want us to just skip past when David says, I won't cover up. That's very important because David was Mr. Cover Up. You say, well, what did he cover up? Well, David, when kings usually go off to war, David decided, I'm just going to chill and take it easy and not be serving. And with all this extra free time, he said, you know, maybe I'll just get up and look out and see who else is out there. Started looking around at other rooftops. And there was a woman, Bathsheba, who was about to take a bath. And David saw that she was beautiful. The problem is that he continued to watch her take a bath. Bathsheba, you could go a lot of puns with that. But um, he watched Bathsheba, shouldn't have been watching Bathsheba in the bath and watched her. Then he had another opportunity to stop and someone said, hey, hey, wait a second. She's married. Hint, David, don't keep going. The bridge is out. And David said, I'm going to keep going anyway. Somebody go get her, slept with her, child, pregnant at least. Then her husband Uriah, David said, I've got to cover this up. Send Uriah to the front lines. Make sure Uriah gets killed. David went from one look to murder, and it was shocking at the end that he had Uriah essentially killed. But whenever there's shocking news, folks, there's always a sequence. 
taking it lazy, looking what you shouldn't have been looking, taking a second look, ignoring the warnings, keep going, going. There's always a sequence before the shocking news. And David marched through all that. And you know what happened after Uriah was killed? He showed up on Sunday morning and said, let's praise the Lord. He showed up at Life Group and he said, look at my new study Bible. He showed up at the prayer meeting. He says, let's pray all night long. He acted as if nothing had happened. He was Mr. Cover-Up. So when we read in Psalm 32, verse 5, that the cover-up is essentially over now, well, here's the first principle. When you stop avoiding reality, progress and growth can start. When denial stops, progress can start. David finally stopped avoiding reality. I've heard it said before, it sounds kind of trite, but there's a lot of truth to it. There's no healing until there's the revealing. David finally revealed what he had done and then the healing came. Psalm 32, verse 8. Listen to these words. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. That's what God wants to do in our lives. And then that's what David, after he's healed, would provide for other people. Let me ask you, what do you think are the three most common hidden sins with Christians today? What do you think people are stuffing under the carpet? Uh, let me take a guess, um, since you asked. Um, <laughs> What about number one, pornography? The numbers are staggering as far as Christians sneaking peeks, repeated peaks at pornography, addicted to pornography, and not just adults. Now the average age for starting in pornography, it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. So that's, that's one. Um, second, what about the bottle? Okay, substitute the drug, but you know, the closet drinker. Uh, how about a third one, unforgiveness? See, these are things you might not be able to detect right away. If I had to pick a fourth, I might say gossip and slander, except that kind of involves other people. But a lot of people like to talk about other people when they're not there behind their backs, and that's kind of secret. So those are some examples of very, very common hidden sins. And so how did things change for David? God raised up a Nathan, and the Holy Spirit spoke through Nathan. Nathan told David a story because David had his walls up. So he said to him, you know, think, David, about a man who had all the cattle and all the sheep, and then think about another man who was very, very poor. And this man only had one lamb. And that lamb was so precious to him. He held that lamb. He would share a glass, a cup, with his lamb. Maybe some of you share a cup with your dog. I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, and and he, would, he would hold that lamb. That lamb could sleep in his bedroom. It was so precious to him. And then you know what? The man who had so much wealth had guests over and said, I'm going to cook up a lamb. Go get that poor man's lamb. Kill that man's lamb. We're eating that man's lamb tonight. And that's what they did. And David heard that story. And he said he deserves to die. He should pay back a, four times of what he's done. And you know what Nathan said? David you're the man. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Maybe the hardest words for our pride to say, I have sinned against the Lord. But it was the start of the healing for David. And God walks us through that. God has a way, doesn't he, of just getting down to the deepest truth and the innermost parts where he wants truth and he gets in there. We had a family friend who went to Belize on an agricultural, uh, kind of it was a job, part internship, went down to Belize, did a lot of different work, outstanding experience, great country. And then, just before returning home, noticed that her cheeks started to swell a little bit. And they were turning red, and she, you know, felt a little flush, and it would come and go, and she wasn't sure what was happening. So when she got back to the States, she met with a few different doctors, different physicians, had theories, but no one really knew what to do. And even though she got a little bit of medication, nothing seemed to help, and the cheeks would continue to get red and swell, and she would feel warm again, and it kept happening repeatedly and repeatedly. Finally, she just said, I'm going to call down to Belize and talk to someone there and ask if this is common and what they do. And she received a cure that surprised her. The person said, well, this is what you need to do. Lie down very still. Get some bacon. Put the bacon on your face. <laughs> Just lie there for like three hours. And she thought, are you serious? But she was desperate. So she lay down, put the bacon on her face. One hour, nothing happened. Two hours, nothing happened. She thought, is this a prank? Is this some kind of joke? The third hour her cheeks, she started to sense a little bit of movement. 
and a little larva came out, crawled out that little worm into the bacon, and then another, and another, and another, and the cleansing started. And you can delay your lunch date for one hour today. <laughs> We're pretty good there. See, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and truth in the innermost parts. Have you ever heard that God's word, it's not just milk, but it's meat? Ooh, should I go there? So, <laughs> so the meat of God's word wants to attract and pull out the sin that's deep in there and can't seem to come out. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have gone there. You get the picture though, right? This cleansing, this deep cleansing that we all need and not just remove the guilt, but the sin and the guilt and the shame and God's gonna take all of that. Folks, this isn't a drive-by guilting or trying to stir up any kind of guilt complex. This is steps. These are steps towards a whole relationship with God where maybe it hasn't been whole, and shalom, peace. In David, he needed this transformation. So here's the next principle. Worldly success can never replace spiritual health. David had stuff, David had money, David had position, David had power, but he didn't have spiritual health. And no matter how much worldly success you have, in fact, I've noticed that sometimes people who have more worldly success can become even better hiders than those that might have less. But the Bible says some people's sins are obvious and others have a secret little trail behind them. So covering up is not something, it started with Adam, it started with Eve, it continued with David. But this is the turnaround. Look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51, David continues to share his story and his testimony. And aren't you glad that there's people in the Bible that are so transparent and just say, this is my story. So Psalm 51 in verse 10, he started to pray this. God created in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, it's been so long since my heart's been pure. It's been so long. And he's watched Saul, the king before him, and Saul's demise and Saul's stubbornness, and he's learned and he's just saying, I don't want to go the way of the king before me. I don't want to follow that path. Create in me a clean heart again, O oh God. I have alcoholics in my family. I've watched the effects of alcoholism. You know, that's been my prayer is that I would not, by God's grace, go down that road because I've seen that destruction. And so, God, would you create in us a pure heart? And David continued in verse 11, don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I'm so tired, he's saying, of trying to do life on my own power and with not much of the Holy Spirit. That's a tough way to do the Christian life. Not much of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He's pleading with God, restore me the joy again, the joy of the Lord, the joy of your salvation. Then he says in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. What a mature viewpoint. God, my freedom from sin isn't just for me. It's so I can help others. In AA, that's part of it. You break free and you have sobriety, but then you turn around and you help some others we got a lot of testimonies in our church. Amen? <laughs> we don't have to keep all those hidden. We have a lot of, I used to. And, and that's by God's grace. I used to. And then now we reach out and you help someone who's right in the middle of that one. And you help them and God uses you. And that's what David's saying. God, I'm available to help others who have been covering up their sin to get real, to get more of the Holy Spirit, to have restoration. He says, I want to do that. And really, you sum this all up, this whole experience, and there's a word in Hebrew, and, and David uses it, the Lord's unfailing love. He looks back over this whole thing, and he just says, the Lord's unfailing love. The word is chesed. Can you say that together? Let's say that together. Chesed. Yeah, now try not to spit on the person next to you and say, chesed. The Lord's unfailing love. He's saying, God loved me even after I messed up. God didn't give up on me. He held me accountable. He went to those deepest places. He brought Nathan. I confessed. There's healing. There's restoration. And I look back on all that and I say, yes, it, the Lord's unfailing love. You know, David's wife had an issue with David. 
Michal, it says. She looked over at David praising the Lord, and she didn't like the way he praised the Lord. He was too excited. <laughs> David would praise the Lord with all his might, and his wife didn't like that. And David sometimes danced before the Lord in joy, and his wife didn't like that either. And he said to his wife, look, I'm going to become even more undignified than this because I know what the Lord's done for me. I know his chesed. I know his goodness. And I just can't keep a small praise. You can praise the Lord with a full heart being still. It's not about actions or dancing or might. But David says, I just can't stop celebrating chesed, restoration, God's faithful love. And so that's what the Holy Spirit does, that kind of accountability that leads to wholeness. Let's take a look at a second aspect of uh, this restoration, and this is reassurance, and we all need reassurance. Amen? <laughs> we tend to be skeptical, doubt, worry. Uh, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 44, and Isaiah is so poetic. Isaiah is really challenging and comforting a nation. And it's a nation in spiritual and moral decline. You might think of our own country in different ways right now, some moral and spiritual decline. And then these words come in Isaiah chapter 44. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you, do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Isaiah is pointing people to the Messiah, to the one who can restore nations and restore an individual heart. And he says that just as water is poured out, just as rain is poured out, is this not a good Seattle verse right here? Just as rain is poured out, so I will pour out my Holy Spirit. And you think about future generations in your family. So when we look at the rain, I'm kind of starting to think the meteorologists in town might have the easiest job. Um, <laughs> looks like it's going to rain today. Actually, we're going to have some light drizzle during parts of the day. So um, they, they get it right. and we have, So when the rains come and they keep coming and coming, let it be a reminder for us a prayer even. God, would you pour out your spirit in our land? Would you pour out your spirit in our church? Just as you keep bringing the rains, so would you pour out your spirit? And for a nation that was dry, this was such an encouragement, dry spiritually as well. So uh, this is uh, the principle. The Holy Spirit can alleviate chronic worrying. I'm not going to ask who our chronic worriers are. I'm not going to ask who lost sleep last night worrying. But I will ask you, what is most common for you when it comes to worry? What are the topics? Do you worry about our nation? Do you worry about the economy? Do you worry about your children? Do you worry about your health? Do you worry about your job, your marriage? What are the areas that you're most prone to worry? And the Holy Spirit can help right there. Notice in this verse, it says in verse 1 in Isaiah 44, but now listen. So important. Let's, who are we listening to? Are we listening to God and listening to his word? Or are we listening to the world and our worries? It starts with listening. And then who do we listen to? The one who made us and helps us and cho chooses us. Do you know what Jesus said about worry? Holy Spirit and Jesus, always in alignment. Jesus said this, you know, who can add an hour to your life by worrying? <laughs> Does worrying help anybody ever? He says, why do you worry? Don't worry about your clothes, the food, the body. In other words, he said, don't worry about anything. He said, take a look. The sparrows, they don't fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. You're much more valuable than sparrows. Look at the lilies on the field. Look at the splendor that God clothes them with. Again, you're made in the image of God. So each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Amen. So don't start worrying about tomorrow. Don't go borrowing trouble from tomorrow. Today, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all will be added. And Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit in John 14, verse 26. He said, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He's going to teach you all things. He's also going to remind you of everything I have said to you. So peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. The Holy Spirit does two things. He teaches us new things and he reminds us of things we already know. You know, some long-term Christians are like, I already know that. I don't want to be reminded of that. The Holy Spirit reminds, teaches you new things and reminds you of what Jesus, reminds you that you're valuable to God, that you are loved, that you are not alone, that you have a hope and a future. Reminds you of the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Keeps reminding you to encourage you when you're prone to worry. You know what's hard to do? Worry and pray at the same time. It's really hard to worry and praise the Lord at the same time. In fact, Philippians chapter 4 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with supplication and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And you know what God will do? The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. God has a remedy for worry. We don't have to worry. And so the Holy Spirit wants to help us alleviate that. And then what is the Holy Spirit doing? This is great reassurance in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So over in the New Testament, past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, you get to 1 Corinthians, and right after 1 Corinthians is, take a guess, 2 Corinthians, you know your Bible, okay. Uh, drop down to verse 16, and it, the Bible says this, Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Moses lived in a time where he was, you know, keeping the law, fasting for 40 days and nights, going up on a mountain, seeking God, getting close to God, and came down from the mountain, and his face kind of glowed. <laughs> you ever been around someone who's been close to God? They almost have kind of a glow on their face. Well, the glow was fading, and Moses put a veil over that. And what Paul does is he picks up on that image and he says, we don't have to put a veil over our face and our glory, well, it isn't fading, but ever increasing glory from glory to glory to glory. It doesn't mean that our spiritual growth will just be like this. <laughs> it, it often looks like that. But this is the point I want to emphasize here. You can trust the process and the ultimate goal of the Holy Spirit. The ultimate goal is to make you and I more like Jesus Christ. It's a very good goal. And then what about the process? The process is where we get tripped up because we live in a culture of instant gratification and we want everything to feel good right now. Did everything feel good right now in Jesus' life? Not at all. So if we're gonna become more like him, you know what C.S. Lewis said, pain is often a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Uh, pain can sometimes be the chisel creating the masterpiece. Uh, God, it doesn't mean all pain is necessarily good, but God will even work through pain that isn't good and then make us more like Christ. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? When life seems a little crazy, uh, a little cray-cray, as uh, my kids say, um, we can trust the Holy Spirit that he is using those situations to make us more like Jesus, <laughs> We can trust him in the process, and we don't have to panic when things aren't as we planned. So, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's what the verse says. The more you trust, the more freedom there is. Say, so, well, what kind of freedom? Freedom from discouragement, freedom from pride, freedom from self focus. <laughs> freedom from me is the center of the universe. Freedom from selfishness. Where the Spirit is, there's freedom. The more we trust the Holy Spirit, the more freedom God brings into our lives. Trusting God works. The more we trust Him, the more reassurance there is. We trust His Word. We trust the Holy Spirit. We trust His leading. We trust the end result. He's making us more like Jesus, and ultimately, He's taken us to glory, and that's really where it's at. In our short run here, 
He makes us more like Jesus, and we can trust him where he's ultimately leading us. So we have accountability and we have reassurance, and it really leads into the third aspect today of restoration, and this is healing. And let's all turn to John chapter 20. And in John chapter 20, drop down to verse 19. The situation is after the resurrection, and Jesus is going to be approaching his disciples, who frankly, you know, haven't been doing so well in their Christian walk. <laughs> and so uh, here comes Jesus with healing. Verse 19, John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They were in retreat mode. They were in scared mode talked at the men's breakfast yesterday about how sometimes guys get passive and we just go into a cave and God says, what are you doing there? Uh, that's what happened to Elijah. And so they're, you know, scared and they're bunkered down and they're, they're not sure what to do. And here comes Jesus and he's basically saying, look, I've overcome. You're going to overcome. Through me, it's going to happen. And so he's alive and that's what he does to us. He comes to us and says, I want to restore. I want to give hope. And they're overjoyed. Here's the principle. God can walk you beyond disappointment and refuel your passion. Beyond disappointment, refuel your passion. One of our beloved family pets when I was growing up, his name was Monty. He was a little poodle. Uh, so enjoyed Monty. And then one day Monty ran out in the street and we watched a van crunch Monty. And he came whimpering back and um, picked him up in our arms. And you could tell Monty wasn't going to last long. And Monty um, didn't last long and we were grieving and mourning. And my mother thought, I need to do something quickly to turn this situation around. She ran out to the local hound, uh, the pound, and found a little dog. And um, this dog's name was Wilbur. And without even, you know, a family discussion, Wilbur comes in the door right after Monty dies. And Wilbur is um, snorting. Wilbur um, is not healthy. Wilbur has patches of hair. You can kind of tell Wilbur wasn't going to last long. Wilbur had heart problems. And it was mom's quick solution to say, we got a dog. No problem. Have you ever had disappointment in your life where you just in panic ran out and said, this will solve it, and you quickly grabbed a Wilbur? <laughs> you know, God told Abraham he and Sarah were going to have a kid. Great plan. Great, great plan. Just wait a little bit, Abraham. Abraham was disappointed. Didn't happen on his time. You ever have God working? Well, maybe not quite on your time. So instead of waiting for Isaac, Abraham said, I'm going to take over. And he slept with Hagar and they had Ishmael. And then later, by God's grace, they, Sarah and Abraham had Isaac. And you know what? Ishmael and Isaac had been going back and forth. And we got trouble in the Middle East. I tell you, you can go all the way back to that rush decision of disappointment, no child yet. Well, let's just, mm, in the flesh, try to make it happen. You know what's important in our walk with God during times of disappointment? To continue to let him walk us through that. And that's what Jesus is doing here. And then refuel our passion. Look what Jesus says next in verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. I think they needed to hear that a couple times. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He cares. They've blown it. They've, they've really, um, you know, scared, abandoned him. Now they're huddled up. They're still scared. They're not walking by faith. He comes alongside them and says, another opportunity. Peace for you. Another opportunity. I think a Jonah who was supposed to go to Nineveh and he went to Tarshish. Have you ever done that? And the Bible says the word of God came to Jonah a second time and said, now go to Nineveh, even though you've blown it in the past, this is a new opportunity. And the disciples, it says, um, he breathed on them and received the Holy Spirit. And you say, what is all this breathing and breath stuff? If you go back to Genesis 2, God took dust and breathed his breath into the dust and gave man life. And then it says in Job, if God withdrew his spirit and his breath, all of us, well, we wouldn't have any more life. We would all perish together. 
He breathes life into us. He sustains us. You don't sustain yourself right now. God sustains you. And as if that's not enough, he says, I want to indwell in you through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, they received and their purpose came back again. I just want to tell you, if you looked at the book of Acts, seven, about seven weeks later, a little while longer, this group is completely transformed because of the Holy Spirit. If you're sitting here today and you say, well, it's been a while since I shared my faith, since I was bold for the Lord, since I, um, you know, really followed him and uh, did what I know he wants me to do, and I don't know if I'm ever going to do it. Receive the Holy Spirit. Seven weeks from now, you might be very surprised at what God's doing in your life if you just receive the Holy Spirit. Spirit. That's what happened in this passage. And then one more encouragement uh, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. It says this, We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us for God is love. Folks, nothing better than God's presence. Nothing better than God's love. Uh, we won't go into detail, but if you could just write down 1 Samuel chapter 30, and there's a verse 6 that has encouraged me at so many points in my walk with God in, in, when I've been tempted to despair. And David, you know, he was anointed to be the next king, and it didn't happen right away. So David, it's estimated waiting time, 13 years to be king, and it wasn't a pleasant waiting room. It was Saul, the current king, firing spears at him on the run, uh, trying to find any food just to survive. So much waiting. And you know, he reached this point in 1 Samuel chapter 30 where the Amalekites came in. They invaded the area. They took the families away. Could you imagine if an invading army took your family away? Well, you know what? Everyone in David's group got bitter at David. He is the leader. And he said, oh, great leadership. Really like what's happening here. And they just thought about killing David at that point. And David, the Bible says, found strength in his God. He found strength in the Lord. And then he turned to the Lord and he said, should we go after the Amalekites? And God says, go rescue your families. And God gave them victory. But when the whole world was not there, David knew God is still here. Have you had those moments? <laughs> and God is still here, and you learn how to find your strength in the Lord. You learn how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I go back to a turning point in my life. It's, it's interesting how sometimes in our life, the worst times are also the best times. And uh, I, it was a time in my early 20s, and it's the way my soccer career ended. I was sick because of a prescribed drug to prevent malaria, and I lost um, my health, nearly died for a year, my career, my dream, didn't have friends around, um, didn't have money. Uh, it was just like asking the question, well, who am I <laughs> with all this gone, and what is still here? And you know what the message is? God's still here, and God's enough. And when you know that deep down, God starts to build on that. And uh, my uncle Dan called me shortly after. And he said, Jesse, and he was probably the one in my family I least expected to turn to Jesus. He called me up and said, Jesse, I just put my trust in the Lord, read a Bible in my hotel, a Gideon's little Bible, read it, Gospel of Mark, just put my trust in the Lord. He said, Elvis isn't king, Jesus is king. <laughs> And, and, and it was just more of that reassurance, more of that healing coming into my life. So God restores. God, he's always with us in his presence, nothing greater. So here's a take home that I want to um, take a minute to unpack here. As I think about our church family and uh, at Grace Church, as I'm trying to listen close to your stories and what you've gone through, one thing I hear often is that our church has had some challenges and we've had some difficulties, and there's probably some wounds. And if you're new here today, I I'm not talking about, um, there's no elephant in the room. There was no shocking big thing. There was no headline in the newspaper that you missed. But just, you know, the challenges that churches go through. And um, that's 
happened here the you know, last several years and so forth. So what do we do at this point? And what does restoration look like? So I wrote down, just took some time to write a few things down that, that you might consider. Number one, don't lose perspective with all the great things God has done. Let's stay thankful to God. Let's stay thankful for our church. You know, I have a tendency as a soccer goalkeeper to keep replaying in my mind the goals I should have saved 20 years ago. <laughs> And I sometimes forget about my teammates and the great times or the championships, and I'm just starting to lock in to those couple of goals that went through my hands and were embarrassing. And so let's stay thankful to God and remember so many good things that God has done. Number two, don't get stuck in the past. That's not where life is. That's, that's not where God's moving today. That's already written. The old saying, you know, how can you drive down the road locked into your rearview mirror? Right? How can you stare at your rearview mirror and drive down five? Not good. So, um, what about the past? Number three, we learn from it. We're all learning from our past. That's one of the, the blessings of having a past, is we learn from it. We learn some things we want to do more of. We want to learn some things we want to do less of. We want to learn some things we need to get rid of. But we learn from the past. And then, uh, here's a fourth thing. This is very important. Forgive. Not just in our church, this is, you know, wider than that. In your family, in your marriage, fully forgive. A lot of people say, I want healing, I want restoration, but I'm not going to forgive. How's that working for you? Uh, healing and restoration come with forgiveness. And God doesn't say, well, forgive if you want to. Forgive if you feel like it. God says, I've fully forgiven you through Jesus Christ. Now you go forgive as Christ is forgiven you. And when you do that, because when you don't forgive, you just hold all that bitterness inside and it's not good for your system, it's not good for your mind, it's not good for your spirit. So you say, it doesn't mean what they did is right, but you say, I forgive them in Jesus' name. And do that today with some people. And number five, we say yes to renewal, personally, in our church family. We give access to the Holy Spirit in every part of our life. In Ezekiel chapter 37, there was a valley of dry bones and said, oh Lord, this, this, and I'm not saying we are all dry bones that don't go there on the application, but in this passage, there were dry bones and we might even think of our own land, you know, dry bones in our country spiritually and God breathed, there's the breath again, breathe new life, tendons and flesh, and the bones became connected, and the bones stood up, and there was an army, and he said, I will put my spirit in you. And by the Holy Spirit, the dry bones became alive and connected together. And I pray that for our country. Uh, here's a, a sixth thing. I just want to say welcome back. I'm meeting people on the weekends, and you're saying, you know, I used to go to Grace. Haven't been a long time. Just coming back. Can we all say welcome back? We all say welcome back right there. Um, so good to have people come back that maybe haven't been going to church in a long, long time. Wonderful to have people back. And then last one, uh, part of this new season, being part of the solution, um, what could be in Joel chapter 2, it says when the Holy Spirit's poured out, the young men, the old men, the men, the women. It talks about dreams, visions, excitement. There's fresh vision. There's, this is um, what I sense in our church. There is so much potential. Amen. And what God could do. This, this next, there's so much potential in this church. So uh, one Greek word I want to end on, uh, katartizo, which means to restore, of course, that's what we're talking about today, to restore, a couple aspects to that, um, to restore healthy condition, healthy functioning. I had a friend and his shoulder popped out. You ever had that or seen that? How good is it when that shoulder's back in? If you've had a broken bone, and now that bone is healed again. That's part of the word. Uh, so a second meaning, um, katartizo, means to mend, make complete. In the Bible, after they caught the fish, they were mending the nets. Katartizo, mending, making the nets complete again. God isn't so much mending fishing nets, he's mending hearts. And the word katartizo also means to prepare, to set the table. And if you ask me, what is God doing? You know, what do I sense these next two months, so these, at this time at grace, I would say katartizo. I would say restoring, 
mending hearts, preparing, setting the table, getting a people ready for what he's about to do. It's a season of catartizo. Here's the take home. The Holy Spirit wants to repair and rebuild what has been damaged. Let's enter in to his restoration, and more importantly, let's make sure he enters in fully to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your restoration. We thank you for your, your gracious hand. We thank you for David's testimony. God, even though sometimes we resist it, we thank you for accountability. We thank you for reassurance when we're on the right path. Again, we thank you for your healing touch. God, we pray in our lives, in our families, in our church, and in our community, catartizo, that you would restore, that you would mend. And Father, today we want to open up our lives and ask the Holy Spirit to come in where we've had walls or pride the Holy Spirit would, would come in. If you've never received the Holy Spirit, you've never put your trust in Jesus for the first time, make that decision today. Don't just go through life without the Holy Spirit, without a relationship with Jesus where you have the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, relationship with God, a Savior who's died for you and is risen. Jesus, we worship you today. Continue to minister and meet us right where we're at as we worship you. In your name we pray. And, and we usually do this at the end of the service, but I want to ask the prayer team to just come forth and be standing um, on the sides here as we worship now. If you want to receive prayer for anything, you can just come forward and receive prayer as well.